all, and thank you everybody for joining this morning, afternoon, or evening. I'm really happy to introduce today's speaker, Kate Gangarapu, who is the second person that joined my lab uh, and the first uh, graduate student in the lab back in 2015. Um, Kartik is uh, well known by now, I will say both from a scientific output, I just wanted to share his, uh, you know, in terms of just getting things teed up, his paper is in fact on the cover of Cell this morning, it's a pretty good paper, uh, pretty good paper and a cool cover. So um, I think that's pretty good timing on Kartik's part to sort of leave, get, get it all lined up. But I will say in addition to just the papers, um, his software too, his efforts with Outbreak.info, which is a team effort with Andrew Seuss Lab and Laura Hughes and many others here at Scripps Research, uh, but also one of the software tool, IVA, which has been used to assemble most of the, I think, 1.5 million SARS-CoV-2 genomes that we have today. So he has spent a wide rare area here, is well known by now, establishes really well. So I am looking forward to seeing his talk. Kartik, take it away. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, right, uh, so for today's talk, I'm, I'm sort of gonna focus um, on uh, our work over the last year on SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, and I have a tight 15 minutes, so I'm, I'm gonna get uh, right to it. So infectious diseases have sort of always been a threat to public health. Um, and have sh shaped socioeconomic factors since like the beginning of human civilization. Uh, the first known uh, epidemic uh, was actually detected in Babylon in 1200 BC with what was thought to be something similar to the flu. Um, and in the old world, uh, most of the pandemics are sort of the plague pandemics and, 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 and smallpox. Um, cut to like after the 1800s, we have a much better record of uh, the different uh, outbreaks that occurred. Um, even over the last uh, five years, we've had the West African Ebola virus epidemic, uh, the Zika virus epidemic, and currently the ongoing uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So um, infectious diseases that sort of been recently discovered and tend to emerge or, or re-emerge and, and cause continuous outbreaks are sort of termed emerging infectious diseases and, and viruses form an important part of, of uh, this, uh, of, uh, these diseases. Um, typically, um, the viruses keep circulating in a reservoir species and keep jumping into the human population and cause outbreaks. Or in cases like Zika, for example, they could continue circulating at uh, low prevalence in the human population and then and, and cause uh, uh, general outbreaks uh, with changes in uh, epidemiology. Um, so the first sort of public health intervention uh, taken based on an epidemiolog epidemiological study was uh, the broad, during the Broad Street cholera outbreak. Uh, this was an outbreak in, in, in London um, during the uh, third uh, cholera pandemic, um, which was raging worldwide at the time. So uh, during this time, it was mainly thought that cholera spread through air. Um, but John Snow, who was this anesthesiologist, had this hypothesis that um, cholera was mainly transmitted uh, via water. Um, so during the 1854 outbreak, he sort of uh, mapped the uh, cases of cholera and he found that a lot of them sort of clustered around uh, this one pump on Broad Street. And he sort of hypothesized that uh, the, the, the outbreak was being uh, transmitted um, due to uh, the contaminated water um, at, at this pump. Interestingly, there was a brewery nearby where there were uh, no cases of cholera recorded. Um, the reason being uh, workers at the brewery were offered a daily ration of uh, water and beer, and well, they, they, they just drank the beer. So, so they, 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 it actually saved their lives. Um, so uh, once he sort of noticed this, he petitioned the local council and they actually had the uh, handle removed. Now it, it, here, I'm showing you the number of cases over time uh, due to cholera and deaths uh, in, in 1854. And you see that the pump handle was sort of removed as the outbreak was waning. So it is debatable. Uh, how much it actually did to curb the spread of the outbreak. But regardless, this is sort of the first recorded public health intervention based on uh, sort of spatial epidemiology. Um, he sort of published these findings in a paper called um, on the transmission of uh, cholera, uh, on the mode of transmission of cholera. Um, but he sort of expanded that work uh, with another experiment, which he sort of termed the grand experiment. So uh, during this outbreak, uh, uh, districts in London were mainly supplied by these two uh, water companies. Uh, region one was supplied by the um, Southwark and Vauxhall company and region two by the uh, Lambeth company and region three was a mix uh, of the two. So he sort of stratified the population based on the water supply and looked at the uh, mortality rate due to cholera across these groups. 
uh, what he found that was that the area supplied by uh, the South Southwark and Vauxhall company had a mortality rate that was roughly five times higher than uh, those supplied by the Lambeth company. Uh, this sort of made sense because Lambeth had actually moved their water intake from the River Thames um, uh, up upstream of where uh, the sewage was actually dumped into the river. So uh, because of that, they were actually not um, supplying contaminated water. Uh, so this sort of confirmed the hypothesis that you know cholera was indeed transmitted uh, via water. So some of the questions addressed in the study uh, formed sort of the basis for modern epidemiology, and John Snow is not now regarded as the father of modern epidemiology. Uh, some of the questions addressed were, you know, when did the outbreak start? How is the outbreak actually spreading? And what are the factors that really sort of uh, drive this outbreak? Now, uh, even in modern epidemiology, even though the, the same questions are tried to be answered, um, there's, a, there's a lot of changes that have happened since 1854. Um, primarily, the human population sort of grown exponentially from like 1 billion to over 7.1 billion. This basically means that it's a very wide geographic range that is occupied by the human population. In addition to this, there's a rapid expansion of the global transportation network. In 2015, there were over 4 billion people that flew um, via uh, airplanes. Um, this essentially means for a given pathogen, uh, the transmission network uh, available is, is both very big in terms of geographic range and also very dense, uh, leading to very complex patterns of spread that can't be uh, described by simply looking at case counts. Luckily, um, as viruses sort of rep replicate, they keep uh, clocking in these uh, mutations um, uh, due to their error-prone replication process. So a lot of information about the transmission of a virus is actually encoded in the genome itself. Um, so couple this with the uh, rapidly decreasing cost of sequencing, you have an opportunity to actually use sequencing to, to track uh, viral outbreaks. Um, but the question still remains is that, you know, given a certain set of genomes that you've sequenced from a population, can you actually go back in time and actually reconstruct this evolutionary history accurately? Now, the first sort of attempts in actually uh, reconstructing evolutionary history on sort of these discrete characters were actually done by Kamen and Sokal in 1983. Uh, they created this fictitious species called communicules and illustrated about 77 uh, different uh, spe species that belong to uh, this group. More importantly, uh, all these species were actually, were actually part of an underlying phylogeny. Uh, for example, uh, 73 here was the common ancestor of this entire evolutionary tree, and, and you had specific groups of species. For example, group A uh, had uh, these uh, illustrated uh, species as part of, uh, its, uh, as part of it. Um, so what they did was they took these illustrations, distributed it amongst uh, students, evolutionary biologists at the time, and asked them to sort of recreate the phylogeny simply looking at just the illustrations. And they found that the people that usually did best um, were those that tried to minimize the number of changes required to explain the entire phylogeny. And this essentially sort of leads us to this principle of a maximum parsimony, uh, which early on was a popular method to actually reconstruct evolutionary history. However, maximum parsing money methods sort of suffer from uh, one key limitation in that they don't actually have any knowledge of the underlying evolutionary process. For example, if a sequence is going from an ATG to an ACG, maximum parsimony will tell us that the mutation is actually a T to a C. However, the underlying evolutionary process could actually be a T to a G to a C um, and, and, and sort of maximum parsimony has no way of identifying if this intermediate nucleotide actually exists. Um, sort of around this time, there was another important uh, discovery made, um, which was the molecular clock. Um, the idea was that they, in, in 1975, they noticed that um, the rate at which these genomes evolved was actually constant over time. Here, I'm showing you some of the uh, data from our older Zika work. Um, every dot here represents a genome. The x-axis is the, uh, the date at which the sample was collected. And the y-axis is genetic distance, which is a measure of how divergent that genome is from a given ancestor. So you see this nice sort of slope um, showing that you know, Zika on average is clocking in about four mutations every year. Now, this is an important concept that is used in what is called divergence dating. Um, the idea being, if you have two genomes, can you actually tell how long it would have taken for them to diverge from a common ancestor? Um, so the first sort of attempts to do this were based on likelihood. Um, the idea was that um, you try to maximize uh, the uh, likelihood of seeing your data given a, uh, given a uh, rate, uh, a, a certain clock rate. Um, in this example here, if you have A, B, and C, or three genomes that you have, um, you can actually maximize the likelihood to reconstruct this evolutionary tree. Um, in this tree here, every branch represents real time. Um, so the estimated ancestor of A and B, which is number two, it would have taken about time T1 to go from two to an A. 
Um, now, uh, early on, the molecular clock was regarded to be constant over time, uh, but then it was found that the molecular clock actually varied significantly um, based on either population bottlenecks or other epidemiological factors. So in order to sort of account for uh, different rates for different parts of a phylogeny, uh, Rambo and Brahman in 1998 came up with this quartet method, where given a phylogeny, a priori, they, they, they grouped, uh, for, in, in this case, they grouped A and B uh, and, and, and just grouped to have uh, one rate mu X and the other part of the phylogeny to have uh, another rate mu Y. So in this way, they were actually able to infer different rates for different parts of your phylogeny. The order and Yang sort of, um, generalize this method for like n different taxa, n different groups and, and with k different uh, rates. Um, however, the problem limitation here was that you would need to know a priori, which parts of the phylogeny would actually require uh, independent rates. And this is usually sort of impossible to de de determine for uh, viral genomes. Um, around this time, you also had another paradigm of actually uh, inferring evolutionary trees, which, which based on the uh, base theorem. Um, the idea here, is that um, you have two sort of main components, the likelihood and the prior. So given some data D, which in this case would be a set of sequences, and let's say you wanna infer a parameter, say the clock rate, um, you have a prior called P of theta, theta, which basically encodes any prior belief you have in what you think that rate should be. Um, you then compute the likelihood and, and, and sort of put together, you get this posterior, which is the probability of seeing a given rate given the data that you have. Um, and, and so by maximizing the posterior, the idea is you, you, you get close to the uh, true parameter uh, of theta. Uh, now, um, the, to, to sort of give you a simple intuition regarding uh, this, this paradigm, imagine you have a coin toss where you know, there's a 50% probability of getting heads or tails. Um, so you compute, uh, so a priori, if I say that you know, my prior belief is that the probability is around 0.16, uh, I compute my likelihood and finally I get this posterior which is close enough to 0.5. Um, however, if I specify a better prior, where I say that, you know, I think the probability of getting heads is about 0.16, you see that the posterior sort of moves closer uh, to the true value of, of, of 0.5. Um, here, the posterior distribution essentially represents uh, just the probability of getting a heads or a tails, but in Bayesian phylogenetics, you, you, the, the distribution will represent the entire uh, sort of a potential uh, evolutionary trees that could explain uh, the evolutionary process. Um, so it's important to have sort of good um, estimation methods um, to actually sample that distribution. Um, a popular method usually used to sample distribution is the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And one of the popular algorithms in those methods is actually the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Um, to sort of give you an intuition about this method, um, this algorithm, uh, imagine you have a normal distribution as defined by a, a mean of 10 and a variance of one. Um, and, and we know this is the probability uh, of a, a parameter that is normally distributed. Um, now we all know how a normal distribution looks, but imagine for a second that, that you don't know what the distribution looks like and, and, and you wanna sort of sample from that distribution. Um, in a Metropolis Hastings algorithm, you start at step zero uh, with some random value. In this case, I'm just starting with one. Um, and you propose a new value in the neighborhood of one, let's say for example, 1.1. Now you can compute the probability given uh, this equation here. So you compute the probability of the new state and the current state. And if the probability of the new state is higher than the current state, you jump to the new state, you basically accept it. Um, if not, um, you then jump to the new state uh, probabilistically based on the probability of the new state. Um, the, 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 the use of this sort of probabilistic jump is that when you're actually traversing the, uh, the, the surface of your uh, distribution, um, you don't wanna end up at a local maxima. You wanna end up with the, at the global maxima. So that probability jump uh, sort of, um, probabilistic jump sort of helps you uh, traverse the entire uh, surface of your uh, uh, distribution. Uh, so you repeat the step for n steps and you get some, a plot like this, which is essentially called a car caterpillar plot. So you see that initially you start off at one, it takes a while to really get to any real estimates of the parameter. Um, this is typically called your uh, burn-in, which is usually discarded. Uh, and typically about 10% of your run is discarded as burn-in. Um, so once you discard that and you look at the uh, density of the space that has been sampled by your uh, MCMC, um, you, you get a distribution like this. Um, and I've actually shown the true normal distribution here and the sample distribution. And you see that it's actually close enough to the actual distribution. Now we sort of sample this distribution without any prior knowledge of how that distribution looks like. 
Um, so this paradigm can actually be, this method can actually be used to um, sort of, uh, you know, sample the distribution of evolutionary trees that could describe um, a given a set of genomes. Um, so typically, you know, let's say for example, you have three different genomes that were sampled at times T1, T2, and T3. The idea is you wanna infer the evolutionary history of these three uh, genomes. So uh, your MCMC will essentially sample uh, n number of trees um, that could potentially explain that, that process. Um, and you, the way you actually summarize this entire distribution is you construct what is called a maximum cleared credibility tree. Um, every node inside of the maximum cleared credibility tree uh, has a probability that is assigned based on uh, the number of times that node was sort of seen across the entire distribution. Uh, giving you sort of an estimate of how reliable the evolutionary tree you're looking at is. Um, in addition to sort of just um, support of each individual node, um, you also have um, an a distribution around each of the parameters here. Uh, because this node has been seen n times in the distribution, you can pull out those values and you get a, uh, get a distribution around uh, the time. Um, so the, the most recent common ancestor of these two nodes here is actually this node. Um, and so, you know, the, these two nodes basically diverged from this node that is estimated to have uh, arose around time T5. Um, so that T5 is actually called the TMRCA or the time to the most recent common ancestor, um, which essentially gives you how, how long it would have taken for these two genomes to diverge from a inferred uh, ancestor. Now that's a term that I'll be using uh, repeatedly uh, during this talk. Um, this is an example of what that maximum cleared credibility tree looks like. This is from our previous work with Zika. You see that there are nodes here um, with uh, the indicated by black dots, which essentially are nodes with very high posterior probability of above 0.95, which means that 95% of the trees in that distribution contain that particular node. And, and you see that you know the, the, there are certain nodes that are well supported and certain nodes that are not as well supported. So this really helps you um, uh, sort of quantify the, um, uh, the uncertainty in sort of your tree topology or the tree structure that is defined here. Um, Bayesian, the sort of Bayesian paradigm really expanded the kind of clock rates you could use. Um, so briefly, there are like three main sort of different clock rates that are used. Uh, one is a strict clock rate, which basically means that your entire phylogeny uh, is so sort of assumed to have one evolution, one evolution clock rate, um, which is similar to what we saw before in the likelihood methods. Um, the real sort of difference here is in the relaxed clock models um, where every branch in your phylogeny can have a different evolutionary rate. And those rates are sort of sampled uh, from a distribution that you can specify a priori. Uh, typically like a log normal distribution is specified um, in this case. So for most of my talk, all of the models will probably most, mostly be using a relaxed clock model. Um, a local clock model is similar to what we saw before in the likelihood-based methods, where specific parts of your phylogeny are, 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 are allotted a different rate based on some prior knowledge. Um, an example of this uh, from our Ebola work is, you know, there was this one patient who, who got Ebola, uh, recovered, um, but uh, um, unfortunately, the, uh, the virus sort of persisted within this individual and caused a relapse almost six months later. Uh, so we know that the evolutionary process sort of governing this branch is different from the rest of the tree, where uh, the rest of the tree is primarily based on uh, transmission of the virus from individual to individual. This branch is, is basically just persistent infection. So we assign a different clock rate to this one branch, and we see that it's almost fourfold lower uh, than the clock rate of the uh, branches in the rest of the uh, tree. So another advantage of sort of using Bayesian uh, phylogenetics is that um, you can infer a lot of uh, uh, parameters in, in one joint model. Um, so, so far we've sort of discussed the tree topology or the structure of the tree and the clock rate. Uh, but in addition, you can also infer things like population size uh, based on coalescent theory and uh, the location clock rate. Um, the location clock rate is essentially the rate at which a virus is sort of changing uh, geographic locations. Um, and that sort of helps you reconstruct the geographic spread of the virus uh, from the genome going back in time. Um, so the, the, the using sort of uh, elucidating this evolutionary history really expands the kind of questions you can answer. So in addition to sort of the three questions I, I'd shown from the, from the John Snow study before, uh, you can now answer things like, you know, how is the virus evolving? What are the specific mutations being uh, accumulated by the virus? Um, how the population size of the virus sort of changes over time and what are the factors affecting the population size? Um, how many times the virus was introduced into a given population, either from a reservoir species or from a different location to a given location of interest? 
Um, and finally, uh, what, what are the transmission patterns of the virus, both um, sort of on a geographic scale and also uh, over time? Um, so this idea of using sort of genomic data combined with epidemiological data in, in one giant framework is termed genomic epidemiology, uh, which has applications to retrospectively invest out, investigate outbreaks or in sort of real time, near real time surveillance during an outbreak. Um, so the first part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about um, how you actually go from sequencing data to assembling a viral genome. Um, so uh, during the 2015-16 Zika virus epidemic, we noticed that it was actually very hard to sequence viral genomes from clinical samples, uh, especially, specifically for Zika, because uh, typically individuals affected, infected with Zika are present with very low viral loads. Uh, unlike, for example, say Ebola, where, uh, you know, uh, the patient present with very high viral loads. So an untargeted sequencing method like metagenomic sequencing wasn't able to actually capture the entire genome. Here I'm showing you sort of the coverage and the average uh, depth of these genomes. You see that you know we're not we're on only only one sample we're able to get to like 80% coverage, um, but even then the average depth was quite low. Um, so the advantage with uh, with Zika was that we already knew what the virus viral genome actually looked like. So Josh Quick and Nick Lohman came up with this protocol called Primal Scheme, um, where it is an amplicon-based sequencing method where uh, you design you essentially have two pools of primers um, that bind to specific regions of the genome, which allows you to um, actually uh, enrich your sample for a given target genome. Sort of using uh, this method, um, we, we we see that we were able to uh, obtain uh, the full genomes of the virus with with, with, with very good average depth. Um, now, because this is sort of an amplicon-based sequencing method, we needed a tool that would actually can could be used to process this kind of data. Uh, specifically, because you're throwing in primers, um, which are sort of you artificially thrown in and are actually not part of the target genome you're trying to sequence. Uh, so we built Ivar to sort of deal with with, with this uh, amplicon-based sequencing data. Um, uh, so the input to IVAR is an, essentially an alignment. So you know the reference genome, you have your sequencing reads and you align it to a reference genome shown in orange here. Um, the uh, blue rectangles indicate forward reads and the green, uh, the reverse reads. In addition to the alignment, IVAR takes the primer positions into account, uh, which I've indicated here in, in two red bands. Um, and the first step that it does is essentially trims off uh, forward primers from forward reads and reverse primers from reverse reads. Um, as we sort of developed IVAR really and made, have had a few releases, we noticed that there were certain labs that were actually using a next era step during their library prep, um, which essentially is a random fragmentation step where um, you take your molecule and you chop it up randomly, which means that not all your reads will actually contain the primer. So IVAR has an option to um, actually either include these reads or exclude them based on the library preparation method. And finally, um, with long read sequencing using uh, sequences like Nanopore, um, it was noticed that often you would find these aberrant amplicons where the read would start with the forward primer of one amplicon and end in the reverse primer of, uh, of a different amplicon. Um, and these reads tended to actually throw off the consensus calling. So we built a simple interval tree uh, to es essentially exclude reads that probably uh, traversed more than one amplicon. Uh, the next step was essentially just um, um, uh, trimming off low quality bases from your reads. This is typically in the Lumina sequencing done uh, at the uh, three prime end of the uh, reads. Um, the next step is actually consensus calling. Now, typical consensus callers assume a deployed genome, which means you have a reference uh, base and a variant. Um, but in viruses, because you're usually infected by a whole population of viruses, um, we, uh, Ivar has more options to sort of fine tune that. Um, the consensus calling could be as simple as to give me the majority base at this site. Um, and, or, or it could be more fine-tuned. For example, say you have a threshold of 60%. So a base, uh, so 60% of the reads that are actually covering that site have to have a certain base to be called in the consensus. Um, otherwise, the bases are sort of ranked in decreasing order of frequency and an ambiguous uh, nucleotide can be called. Uh, the final step is actually variant calling. Um, um, which helps you sort of quantify intra-host uh, viral diversity, um, but we, we we haven't um, we haven't really dealt with um, calling accurate uh, intra-host variants, um, especially at lower frequency. But that should be in the works, I think. Um, so uh, we sort of released IVAR at the end of 2018. And, and once the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic started, uh, the primal uh, scheme protocol became exceedingly popular and, and, and is probably the uh, most widely used protocol to sequence SARS-CoV-2 genomes. And, and, and so as a result, a lot of people started using IVAR uh, to actually process their sequencing data um, as evidenced by the number of releases we, we, we have over uh, the, the year 2020. Uh, the most recent release was in February where there was a, a swift protocol 
which was amplicon based um, that tended to add additional bases to the uh, five prime end of your uh, reads. So you, when you're looking for your primers, you would have to actually make that uh, search more fuzzy to account for these additional uh, bases. And as Christian mentioned right at the beginning, um, Ivor has been reasonably um, sort of accepted by the community with over 13,000 downloads on Conda and, and a lot more on Docker. And uh, a lot of consortia have also been using it, so which has been remarkably helpful, um, both in terms of us getting uh, uh, bug, uh, uh, getting bu getting uh, rid of bugs and 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 improving uh, the tool in general. Um, so so far, we sort of discussed, you know, how you go from sequencing data to an actual consensus genome. Uh, so typically, once you assemble consensus genomes, you deposit them to a public repository, be it either uh, during SARS-CoV-2, the most popular one is GZ, um, or you could also have uh, NCBI as a repository. Um, for the next part of my talk, I'm going to talk about how you sort of combine genomic data and epidemiological data to really investigate, um, retrospectively investigate outbreaks. Um, so I'm going to focus on uh, two major outbreaks during, uh, during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. One is the early outbreak um, of infections in uh, New Orleans, and the second is the actual B117, um, growth of B117 in the US. So early on in the pandemic, um, uh, New Orleans had the first wave of infections in New Orleans sort of started early and rose very steeply. Here I'm showing you the daily number of reported cases per 100,000 residents for three metro areas, uh, New Orleans, New York, and Seattle. And, and you see that you know, the peak in New Orleans is even higher uh, than in New York and, and rose very rapidly. Uh, the first, first case of COVID-19 was detected on March 9th in New Orleans. And here I'm showing you the number of cases over time. So as a first step to any genomic epidemiology study, we went in and sequenced about 152 genomes from this first wave of infections. Um, we tried to sequence genomes proportional to the number of cases, but obviously we're, 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 we're undersampled uh, here. The first thing we noticed was that the genomic diversity of these genomes in New Orleans was actually very limited. It's actually very comparable to the genomic diversity that you find on cruise ships. Uh, essentially showing that you know there were probably very few introductions of the virus into New Orleans and and uh, probably very homogenous in terms of gen genetic diversity. When we actually go back and reconstruct our evolutionary history, we actually find that there's only one major introduction uh, into uh, New Orleans with a TMRCA dating back to um, median of 13th uh, February. Now uh, the TMRCA and the time of introduction are related, but 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 they're not the same thing. Um, in this schematic here. Um, is from uh, Plessy et al. Uh, you see that you know if, if you have a set of cases, these are all these are all cases in, within the UK, and and you have a TMRCA here. Um, the introduction could have happened at some point before the TMRCA, anywhere along this branch. So in order to actually identify the time of, time of introduction, uh, we look back at the sort of the geographic reconstruction um, of of the virus. Um, so if we look at when the uh, virus actually jumped into New Orleans uh, using geographic reconstruction, you see that the um, virus first got into New Orleans um, on, on February uh, 11th. Um, when we look at the source of this single introduction and where it, this, it's coming from, we see that most of the time these jumps actually come from uh, Texas, showing that the epidemic in New Orleans is, 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 is strongly connected to Texas. I say connected to um, because as with any analysis method, the uh, bias in your underlying data set will affect your final results. Um, so there could be an intermediate location that we do not, did not sample and is not present in our data set. So it could also be an indirect jump from Texas into New Orleans. To sort, of, uh, uh, to sort of address this issue, uh, we looked at a secondary line of evidence using travel risk. Um, the, 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 the first step in, in actually computing a travel risk is to estimate the number of infections. Uh, now remember, this was in sort of in February when there was little to no testing being done. So any reported cases were highly biased by that. Um, we assume that the daily deaths are less biased compared to the, the reported number of infections. So we use the daily deaths to then estimate the daily uh, number of uh, infections. Um, back in uh, February. Um, more formally, we sort of use this epidemia package from LSHDM to, to, to do this, to estimate the number of infections. Um, very briefly, given a certain number of observed deaths, um, you assume a, a, a distribution of like the time from infection to death and the infection fatality rate. Um, in our case, we assumed a distribution of time from infection to death uh, based on the data from Europe. Um, and we assumed an infection fatality rate of 1%. 
Now that you actually have the daily number of infections, you now need to compute when these infections would, act, would actually start becoming uh, infectious. Um, so we sort of follow this sort of schematic here where uh, you, we know when the initial infection happened. And so we assume that the, uh, the individual would start becoming infectious a day before a uh, symptom onset. Um, and, 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 and we assume that the individual is likely to travel throughout the infectious period, except if they received a positive clinical test. To actually estimate uh, you know, which individuals received a positive clinical test, uh, we basically look at the number of reported cases. So, um, so uh, more formally, uh, this is the distribution we assume for time to onset of symptoms. So given a, a number of infections on a given day I, um, we, we, we estimate that you know, the, the, those cases would start becoming showing symptoms according to this distribution. Um, we assume that uh, the individual would become um, infectious a day before symptom onset. Um, and so uh, we then use this infectious period to estimate how long an individual that became infectious would, would remain uh, infectious. Um, in addition, we sort of subtract the daily number of reported cases um, uh, say, saying that, you know, the, the, assuming that the number of reported cases would actually not travel. Um, so this sort of gives us the an estimate of the number of infectious individuals at any given point in, in a given location. Um, so if you have a source and a destination, in, a, in order to actually compute the travel risk, um, of, of the risk of importing the virus uh, from a source to a destination, um, we, we, we first look at sort of mobility data uh, from SafeGraph, which gives us an estimate of the number of travelers moving between a source and a destination. Uh, we take the number of infectious individuals at the source, divided by the population at the source and then multiplied by the number of people moving between source and the destination. And this sort of finally gives us the amount of the risk of importing the virus from a given source to a destination. Um, so we looked at this travel risk um, in the context of New Orleans and we found that um, in week seven, which is when we estimate the uh, first introduction of the uh, virus into New Orleans, that Texas and Florida are sort of the top two locations that uh, have the highest risk of importing the virus into uh, New Orleans. Um, this essentially is, it presents a second line of evidence showing that the epidemic in New Orleans uh, was probably seeded by, uh, uh, from Texas. Um, sort of uh, going back to the uh, sort of the model number of infections, um, here I'm comparing the number of uh, daily infections um, in, in New Orleans to other metro areas in the US. Um, so, so you see that, you know, a similar picture compared to the number of reported cases where uh, the uh, first wave of infection started early in New Orleans and rose very quickly, with the exception of New York, where, you know, early on the cases rose quicker than in New York, but New York quickly took over. Um, however, it's important to keep in mind that New York is, pro has pro is, is a far more popular travel destination and, and, and has a more densely populated um, it's more densely populated, so there's significant differences in epidemiology here. Now, uh, the one event that sort of sets apart uh, New Orleans around this time period from these other metro areas uh, is actually uh, Mardi Gras, which draws uh, over a million visitors into New Orleans in every year. So, um, if in, in fact, when you look at the time of introduction, we see that there's a 98% probability the virus is introduced into a New Orleans before Mardi Gras Day, which is uh, February 25th. Uh, when we look at travel, um, we see that there is an increase in travel coming from Texas uh, into New Orleans uh, during the week of Mardi Gras. So, uh, given sort of all these uh, <clears throat> all these things, we assume that you know there's probably something Mardi Gras is probably important, and we try to quantify the number of infections that would have been caused on Mardi Gras Day itself, which is uh, February 25th. In order to do that, we actually look at two separate models. So the first model is the model we use to get the daily number of infections, uh, which gives us an estimate of the cumulative number of cases, number of infections required to sort of recapitulate this epidemic curve. Uh, for the second model, uh, we know that there was one single introduction into New Orleans. So we sort of simulated the number of uh, cases that would have been caused by one introduction um, uh, starting on February uh, 13th, all the way to Mardi Gras Day, February 25th. Uh, in order to do that, we, we used a um, negative uh, binomial branching process model, um, where we assume that every the number of secondary cases caused by a single primary case sort of followed this distribution uh, described by an R naught and a over dispersion parameter k. Uh, the over dispersion parameter k is essentially, um, uh, we, we assumed it to be 0.16, uh, which is characteristic of uh, SARS-CoV-2 to show the uh, variation in transmission uh, of the virus. Uh, to actually look at r naught, uh, we looked at the uh, daily infections and, and, and we used an r naught estimated from there about 
Um, so this sort of gives us the cumulative number of infections that would have been caused by one single introduction over that time period. So, you know, you have two different models here, uh, one sort of going forward in time, starting from one case um, all the way till, till Mardi Gras. And you have a second model, uh, which is sort of inferring the cumulative number of infections that have been caused based on daily deaths. So uh, we, we, as you, we, we, so the difference between these two models will essentially be uh, the total number of infections caused on Mardi Gras day, because both these models are sort of unaware that an event like Mardi Gras happened. Um, and so uh, the estimates should line up. And so the difference would be the number of infections on Mardi Gras day itself. Um, and in fact, when we look at the when we look at sort of that difference, uh, we, we we see that there's a 94% probability that at least 100 infections were caused on Mardi Gras Day itself, showing that it was indeed a super spreading event and probably responsible for the early first wave of infections in in New Orleans. Now, the effect of sort of the first wave of infections um, is sort of lasted longer in Louisiana. So you know, Louisiana has had about three different um, peak uh, waves of infection since, since, since April. Um, and so if you look at the number of genomes in, in the second wave, you see that roughly about 40% of them uh, descend from the genomes from the first wave, showing that you know, the, the, the first wave had a lasting impact uh, on the epidemic in, in Louisiana. So, uh, so far we've sort of looked at the virus coming into New Orleans and, and, and the story within New Orleans. Uh, so for the next bit, we actually looked at uh, the other regions that were probably seeded by New Orleans during this time period. Uh, so going back to sort of the geographic reconstruction from the ge genomic data, um, we see that uh, there are a lot of uh, New Orleans probably seeded um, outbreaks in Texas and other parts within Louisiana itself. Um, in particular, I want to draw your attention to Mississippi. At the time, we only had about six genomes from Mississippi, um, but all six of them sort of clustered along with uh, sequences from Louisiana. Um, and indeed, when we look at travel risk, we see that um, most other states uh, are somewhere between 30 to 40 percent uh, chance of importing the risk from New Orleans, uh, except for Mississippi, which is consistently above 50 percent, um, showing that New Orleans was probably a major source of the epidemic in, in, in Mississippi. Now, uh, around the time we were sort of wrapping up this project was when uh, we started detecting the first uh, instances of uh, B, the, the B117 lineage uh, in the US. Um, so the, the B117 lineage um, essentially um, is a variant of concern um, and, and it, it, it very quickly clocked in about uh, 14 amino acid mutations um, and, 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 and is shown to be uh, about over 50% more transmissible. Um, here I'm showing you the, uh, the collection date of these different genomes and the genetic uh, distance on the y-axis. Uh, you see that you know, the, this, this sort of lineage very quickly clocked in a large amount of genetic divergence and, and it continued evolving. The, uh, the ongoing hypothesis is that this probably happened um, within a, some sort of uh, immunocompromised patient. And so the evolutionary process governing that gain of those 14 amino acid mutations is different from the evolutionary process uh, governing the evolution uh, of the virus um, uh, otherwise. Um, specifically, these are sort of the uh, 14 amino acid mutations. Here I'm showing you the mutations within the uh, spike gene uh, itself. So uh, around this time, um, we collaborated with, 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 with Helix, which is a company that does testing um, across the US. And so they were also specifically looking for uh, the B117 lineage. So um, we, we, fit, uh, we took the proportion of B1, B117 cases over time, and we fit a logistic uh, growth model to it. Um, and we saw that the uh, proportion of B117 cases was growing at a rate of 8% per day. Um, we uh, inferred a transmission increase uh, using a assuming a serial interval, um, and so we showed that the B117 lineage was about 41% uh, more transmissible than uh, previously circulating lineages in the U.S. Uh, further, we sort of extrapolated this uh, logistic growth function over time and showed that you know B117 would probably be dominant in the U.S. by late March. Um, this study was sort of done uh, late January, uh, but cut to sort of uh, March, we saw that uh, our prediction was was not on point, but, but, but close enough, where you know, around March 30th was when the, the prevalence of B117 um, exceeded uh, 50%. Now, in addition to sort of just the testing data, uh, they also sequenced a bunch of the B117 cases. And, and so um, we, we reconstructed the evolutionary history of these genomes, and, and, and we see that there were at least 22 independent introductions of the B117 lineage into the US. Um, specifically, you know, there were sort of these two large introductions into Florida and one large introduction into California. 
uh, it's important to keep in mind that in terms of our sampling, uh, most of our sequences actually come from Florida and California. And so that is probably why you see large clades of Florida and California here. Um, sort of more importantly, when we look at the TMRCA of these clay, of these groups of sequences, uh, we see that the earliest introduction in the US happened uh, in, in late November. And over the next two months, there were sort of repeated introductions of the virus into the US from an unknown uh, location. Um, when you look at these individual groups of sequences and see the look at the geographic sampling, you see that you know clades like the Florida and California are more homogeneous um, in terms of the geographic sampling, but clades like uh, mixed five actually have a mix of uh, sequences from Georgia, Texas, and other states, um, essentially showing that there was probably ongoing local transmission uh, starting in December and over the next two months. Um, however, uh, given sort of the limited sampling time of just two months um, and the limited genomic diversity, uh, we weren't able to sort of determine the direction in which this movement was actually happening. So, um, I mean, I hope I've convinced you with like these two studies that, that, that Genomic epidemiology is exceptionally useful uh, to, to sort of uh, elucidate transmission patterns uh, of an outbreak um, with, with unprecedented detail. Um, in addition to sort of uh, retrospective investigations, genomic epidemiology is also useful to sort of uh, do almost near real-time genomic surveillance. Uh, I'm going to very briefly go over our work with outbreak.info here. Um, so as the sort of pandemic started um, the, from the, the Rambola from University of Edinburgh, came up with this nomenclature called uh, the Pango uh, 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 nomenclature, where um, as the sort of uh, virus is sort of evolving and you look at a global evolutionary tree of the virus, specific groups of sequences are, are, are indicated with different lineages uh, to actually be able to capture the growing diversity of the virus. Um, so there's over, over thousand different pango lineages assigned and of which there's like sort of four main variants of concern. Um, these variants of concern have shown to have a specific um, <clears throat> impact on host disease. Uh, for example, B117 is shown to be uh, more transmissible than previously circulating lineages. Uh, B1351 and P.1 have some degree of evading immune response. And most recently, the B1617.2 lineage from um, was first detected in India um, seems to be uh, as transmissible or probably more compared to uh, B117. This was uh, based on data from uh, PHA uh, uh, from the UK. So, um, you know, typical sort of surveillance tools um, rely on a phylogeny to, 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 to actually elucidate evolutionary history. Um, so, you know, most of these tools, because um, of the limitation of phylogenetic methods, most of these tools sort of limit themselves to about 5,000 to 6,000 genomes to, in, in order to keep updated in real time. Uh, however, currently there's about 1.5 million SARS-CoV-2 genomes available on, 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 on GZ, uh, which means that these methods cannot actually scale um, due to the limitation of the underlying phy for phylogeny uh, estimation itself. So there was sort of this need uh, opened up to actually um, uh, have a surveillance tool that wasn't really phylogeny focused, but rather sort of focused on the changing prevalence of lineages over time. Um, more importantly, uh, we, we, uh, a tool that could actually integrate different types of data together, um, epi data, which could be reported cases or death, deaths, uh, genomic data, and, and publicly available uh, literature. So um, a quick demo here. Um, this is sort of the, um, on Outbreak Info, you can look up specific location reports. This is the uh, location report for San Diego. Um, you see that there were 10,000 sequences that were sequenced um, in San Diego itself. Um, and, and over time, you see that the B117 lineage is sort of becoming more dominant with a recent uh, spike in, in, in B.1, uh, mostly uh, related to uh, travel. Um, you can also see things like the prevalence of different mutations across these lineages. Uh, for example, the E484K mutation um, is, you know, is, is most prevalent in the uh, P.1 lineage. Uh, in addition, you can sort of compare the uh, growth rate in the growth in the prevalence of uh, different lineages with the number of reported cases, allowing you to really assess trends between um, the growth of a certain lineage and, and how that affects the actual number of reported cases. Um, so yeah, with, with, with that, I want to sort of wrap up and briefly sort of talk about a future directions. Um, one important thing is, you know, the, like I just mentioned, there's about 1.5 million genomes of SARS-CoV-2, um, and that scale sort of changes everything. Um, in, in, you know, the, the first case is, you know, so for example, if you're trying to investigate a certain outbreak, you really you need to really think about how you're going to downsample the number of sequences because current Bayesian phylogenetic methods are sort of limited to around 
around 2000 sequences. Um, and, and so if you have to go from a million down to 2000, you need to be really careful that uh, downsampling is actually not affecting the results of your analysis. The other aspect of scale is actually the, the types of data that are also available. Um, you have genetic data, epi data, you also have other types of molecular assay data, a lot of structural information and, and sort of integrating all of those together um, into one sort of uh, analysis is, is, is a hard uh, is a hard job with, with a lot of people working on it. Um, specifically, I think Nate and Edith in the lab are, 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 are trying to investigate SARS-CoV-2 in San Diego and Jordan, and they've been dealing with uh, some of these downsampling issues itself. Um, the second thing is is really accuracy versus speed. So you know the the hardest part in any sort of Bayesian phylogenetic analysis is actually the search um, for the uh, right topology of a tree um, to actually find uh, the, the the topology that would explain your evolutionary process best. Um, so recently there have been advances in sort of variational Bayesian inference where instead of, you sacrifice some amount of accuracy in the interest of speed, where instead of actually trying to get the actual posterior distribution, you try to approximate that uh, posterior distribution. Um, this has been some recent work from um, Eric uh, Madsen's group and, and others. Um, uh, Guy, who actually kindly uh, agreed to be here, is also working on, on, on has also had some work on um, trying to reuse previous analyses of, uh, uh, of evolutionary trees. So, you know, if you have an analysis and you have like, let's say five new genomes that have popped up, uh, he's developed methods to actually add those five genomes and sort of update the analysis um, and, and reuse the search results from your previous analyses as opposed to sort of doing the whole thing um, from scratch. Um, uh, the, the, on the application end of things, you know, things like um, climate change are really changing the geographic range of where you see reservoir species. Um, West Nile is first detected in Netherlands in 2020, as mainly probably due to the expanding range of Culex uh, uh, mosquitoes, which are the, which is the primary vector for uh, West Nile. Um, Raf in the lab has been doing some work to explore how changing climatic conditions change the host suitability of uh, mastomus Metalantis, um, which is sort of the host of uh, Lassa virus. And, and so, you know, when, when host sortability changes and the geographic range of a host changes, then the virus is being introduced into naive populations. And this is probably one uh, important, uh, other sort of important application of genomic uh, epidemiology. Um, and finally, I mean, I think uh, due to throughout this talk, I've shown you the importance of actually using genomic epidemiology to actually get really fine resolution answers to uh, questions uh, during an outbreak. And so tighter sort of integration into routine public health practices um, would, would, would be uh, very beneficial. And, and we're seeing a lot of instances of this uh, during the ongoing uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And with that, I'm close to done. I have a couple of acknowledgements. I don't get a lot of chances to thank people, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go over the whole thing. Um, so um, primarily, um, Bob Carey Lab, Jeremy Camel, Juan Cooper, folks at BioInfo Experts and Helix, who collaborated with us on the genomic epidemiology projects and, and, and sort of uh, willingly shared data with us and helped us out with the analyses. Um, Max and Lauren from Johns Hopkins, who helped us with um, analyzing some of that mobility data. Uh, Gidas, uh, who has been taking calls with me every two weeks for the past two, three years, um, answering questions in phylogenetics, and he's been remarkably helpful. Um, um, the Search Alliance in San Diego, specifically Rob Knight's group, Junior's group, and Luis Veron's group, uh, who we collaborate with to actually conduct uh, genomic surveillance within San Diego. Philippe and Mark, um, who, well, uh, and, and Guy, in fact, who actually built uh, Beast, which is the which we use to actually do a lot of our phylogenetic analyses um, and who are also critical to sort of uh, helping us set up analyses for the genomic epidemiology projects. Um, I wanna thank my committee, um, Ali, Erica, and Bill who, who sort of supported me throughout my PhD um, and, 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 and Guy who kindly agreed to uh, be my external examiner even though it's, it's I think the night in Belgium right now um, yeah, on a public holiday. Um, uh, Alicia, Paul, and Don from the Scripps Research Graduate Program uh, for sort of organizing this whole thing and, and, and their support uh, throughout my PhD. Um, I want to thank Nate Gruber, who was a postdoc in the Anderson Lab, so who has since started his own lab at Yale, um, with whom I did uh, a lot of my earlier Zika work, um, but um, I didn't really uh, didn't really get a chance to talk about that here. Um, Jerry Zhang Chao and Chun Li from the Wu Lab, uh, who um, work on bio things, which is sort of the infrastructure we use to really scale outbreak data info to uh, about 1.5 million genomes. Uh, Emily, Ginger, Marco, and Laura, who've been working hard around the year, um, uh, sort of 
trying to keep uh, develop outback.info and maintain it. Um, Laura in particular has taught me a lot about actually working with uh, data and, and, and working with her has been an absolute pleasure. Um, Lewis and Jake um, were buddies of mine who have since graduated from the Sulab. Uh, ben Good, with whom I published my first research paper, um, and Ben and Andrew were actually the first people to encourage me to apply to grad school. Um, Andrew is my one of my advisors and has also been mentoring me since undergrad, so for about like I think eight years now. Um, and and his advice has always been on point and and, and very invaluable to me. Uh, in the Anderson Lab, uh, Manar. Uh, who who was an intern with us who developed an R package for Outback.info and is now starting graduate school soon. Um, Katie, Ezra, and Justin have been working on the clock over the last year uh, to sequence SARS-CoV-2 in San Diego. Al worked on uh, Beyond and, and some parts of Ivar. Um, Nate and Glenn are fellow graduate students of mine. Nate's been working uh, on SARS-CoV-2 and also uh, some, some work on West Nile. Uh, Glenn's been working on Zika. Raf, as I mentioned, has been doing really cool stuff with Lhasa. Uh, Edith has been working on SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Matthias has since left, left the lab for a startup, but he, he, he had a lot of input uh, when we were uh, developing IVAR. Uh, Rafuyo, Emily, Michelle McGraw, Michelle Potero, they keep the lab running like clockwork and have covered for me multiple times when I've uh, messed up with dates and stuff. Um, Mark Zeller, I've actually worked longest with Mark um, for four years, whether it was staring at alignments, bug fixes for IVAR, or uh, the SARS-CoV-2 projects that he co led with me has always been around. Of course, when things got really tough, he, he would send me images like this, where he estimates like, um, just as the probability of this sort of MCMC run drops, my career would also go have a downward trend. Um, I, I, I think he was uh, joking. Um, uh, and, and finally, Christian. Um, uh, yeah, Christian sort of uh, framed my scientific outlook in more ways than I can describe. Um, I think throughout the PhD, I've failed many, many times, and regardless of the outcome, he's always sort of supported me and, 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 and encouraged me to pursue my own ideas. Um, finally, my friends here, um, Singha, Sid, Mike, James, and Henry, um, they've been around for this whole time period, whether it was me cribbing about analyses not working or giving me a ride to the grocery store, they've, they've, they've always been around and, and you guys are the best. With that, I'm done. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kartik. That was awesome. Um, and I'll say my encouragement last one night, of course, was uh, don't disappoint us today, which I think we can all say that Kartik certainly did not. And this was a fantastic talk. And as you can see, an amazing amount of work. And I should say a tiny fraction of it. Kartik, you know, doesn't like to talk about, you know, all the great stuff that he has done but there's a lot of work you didn't get a chance to, 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 to discuss today. So really, really impressive. So um, we're running a little close to the 11 a.m. I'll say we'll, we'll run a little over because there's a few, you know, a lot of good questions here. So I wanna make sure that, that we get an opportunity to go through those. If people have other questions, please uh, post them in the, the Q&A. And Kartik, I'll, I'll read them out and then, um, and then, and then, then you can, um, then you can can answer. The first one is from 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 Nate, and uh, Nate is asking that you many of your models have a number of assumptions, which I think is safe to say, uh, and it varies, you know, between the models, of course. But his question is that do you have any concerns about some of those assumptions not being true, and have you examined the robustness of the the results? In other words, how much do you rely on the model assumptions for the results that you're going to to actually get in the end? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I mean, I think um, let me walk through a couple of assumptions. For example, in uh, the simulation uh, here, um, we sort of assumed, you know, um, we sort of assumed a certain R naught and, and and a K parameter based on prior data. Uh, we actually carry out sensitivity analyses, testing uh, multiple different um, uh, R naught values and K values, and, and and we show that regardless of the initial assumptions, uh, you the the conclusion itself does not change. Um, when it actually goes to um, modeling the uh, actual um, the number of infections here, um, the, we what we do is um, here we actually don't specify an infection fatality rate of one percent directly. Uh, what we do is we set up prior. And that is around with a mean of one percent. Um, so the model itself sort of infers a different uh, a, a, the, the infection fatality rate. 
Um, I think the other assumptions were probably here. Um, I agree that some of these assumptions of a day before, you know, the infectious period starting a day before are, 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 are not straightforward. Um, but, but we're sort of limited by, we don't have a very good estimate of when that actually happened. So, so some of those limitations uh, might be tricky, but have been sort of widely used in literature. So we went ahead and used them. But in general, when we, when we make any assumptions, we try to test them out uh, using uh, sensitivity analysis. Yeah, and one question there is that when we're wrong, what typically are we wrong about and how wrong are we? Because um, again, there's a lot of my TMRCAs and number of introductions, I mean, and, and all of these modeling too, but there's a lot of assumptions, right? But when things go wrong, how wrong do we actually end up being and how does it affect the, the conclusions? I think in general, we're fairly confident that your final conclusion will not change. Um, I think you, you, you might find that, you know, the, the values might be off, for example, uh, when you look at your travel risk, these values might be off by a little bit, but in general, the, uh, the, the final conclusions of the result itself uh, do not change. Um, and, and as far as possible, we sort of test this out uh, with sensitivity analyses to see uh, what, what effect these assumptions have on our final results. Right. Um, second question here is from Doug Evans. Uh, great talk, Kartik. Uh, can you comment on how the introduction of vaccines might impact your ability to model COVID-19 transmission? So for example, when we look at P117, assumes to an extent a naive, naive, naive population, as we are rolling out vaccines, how might that actually limit our ability to, to do these types of analyses? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I think specifically in the B117 example, at the time we assumed a naive population, um, but I think as sort of vaccines, um, sort of, you know, the, the vaccines have become more widespread, um, as, as an example, for example, here, we're looking at the proportion of B117 cases. Uh, we're not actually looking at the entire population. We're only looking at the percentage of COVID-19 cases. So as the vaccination sort of increases, your percentage, overall number of COVID-19 cases will go down, but that proportion will still hold. Um, when it actually comes to um, transmission of B117, that's when with vaccination will get tricky uh, because you know you, you're going to have vaccinations sort of cutting off uh, transmission chains of B117. Um, you, we could there have been attempts to sort of model this using uh, compartment models like SCIR, um, but it is not it is not very straightforward to to actually show um, how what sort of an impact it will have on the subsequent spread. Um, so that is as far as sort of, you know, just the epi modeling goes. In terms of genomics itself, um, with sort of an increase in, 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 in sort of vaccination, um, you might find uh, different sort of evolutionary processes of the virus. For example, um, the uh, B1351 lineage um, that was first detected in South Africa, um, you know, is known to have some, some level of uh, immune evasion. Uh, so uh, in, in, a, in a vaccinated population, you could see that, you know, previously circulating lineages will probably all go down in prevalence, but B1351, the prevalence would, would, would still increase. And, and you would sort of capture that sort of information in your evolutionary tree. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, that definitely answers the question. And I think it's a good point, right? Because again, how these are going, the lineages are going to compete over time changes depending on what we do. I think one key thing to say here, though, is that while we might see something like the, the 351 lineage increasing in relative frequency, as we ramp up uh, vaccinations, we would very much expect the absolute numbers of cases to continue to decrease dramatically. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's pretty, sure. that's pretty important when we look at these competitions, right? That sure, the relative frequencies will change. Likely P1 is another one, right? Um, and I, th I think we're even starting to see that now, but really importantly, the absolute, absolute numbers, uh, both of the variants as well as non-variants continue to decline. Um, which is important. So a good uh, question here from Elizabeth going straight to the big questions, which is that given everything you have learned uh, during your entire PhD, but especially over the last year here, is that what lessons have we learned here? And how would you like to see them apply to public health policies in the US and more globally to most effectively limit the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. In other words, how can we do better based on the kind of stuff that you have you have learned here? That's a that's a big question. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think okay. So, 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 I think you know, the, 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 even over the progress of the pandemic, it, it, it's sort of been seen that you know, genomic surveillance is actually the only reliable way uh, to actually uh, be able to surveil sort of the changing mutational landscape and to see how the sort of evolving diversity of the virus will be affect will affect things like vaccinations. Um, so we definitely need a tighter integration of genomic sequencing into sort of routine public health. Um, so you, you can see this sort of play out over the pandemic where early on, if you look at the date at which a sample was collected and a sequence was actually deposited, that lag was actually quite high early on in the pandemic. Um, but that sort of rap has, has decreased now, I think it's on average like 20 days in the US. Um, so, so, so you have sort of the pipelines required to go from sample collection all the way to actual sequences. And you, you see that the, the, the lag in that time going down and, and that is extremely useful uh, to have you know, almost near real time sort of genomic surveillance. Um, so we definitely need tighter integration on that front. Um, I think some of the other things are also, you know, for example, like the B117 lineage and, and the B1351 was essentially only detected because of genomic sequencing where they noticed that, you know, this lineage was sort of growing in prevalence and when they looked into it, they actually found, um, they, they actually led us to some mutations that could actually have a big impact on host disease. So it's it's not just the US, but rather you would need genomic sequencing sort of, uh, you know, scaled up globally because, you know, the pandemic clearly, the virus clearly doesn't care which country you really belong to. And so it's able to move around pretty quickly. Um, uh, yeah, and so, yeah, so essentially tighter integration of genomic sequencing into regular public health. Um, and of course, on the methods front, you know, Bayesian phylogenetic methods right now are currently sort of limited about 2000 sequences and, and, and you wanna really be able to accurately infer evolutionary history. So that there needs to be a lot of development on the methods front itself. I think over the pandemic, we've seen a lot of tools being used, but were, that were not really meant to be used at such a large scale, but sort of retrofit into 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 these into uh, to be to being used. Um, and so that worked during this pandemic, but 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 there's clearly a lot of development on that front that's needed to really scale up uh, such analyses. Uh, yeah, and I'll say, and I to totally agree. And I, I will I will add one 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 sort of insight on my own side too from from your research. Right, is that when we looked at B one one seven which was detected in the UK and they warned the world and said, look, you need to take this seriously. And that was not done in the United States because we always, always in this waiting pattern and say, well, maybe it'll be different here because it never is different, right? It's always the same. But, but again, there's this belief that maybe it's different and what your paper shows is actually it's no different, right? What the issues that dealt with in the United Kingdom, we're going to be dealing with in the United States too, if we don't do something really proactively. And again, the lesson here from that study is that we can now see B117, as we predicted, is now the dominant one all across the United States. Of course, we rolled out vaccines rapidly, which really helped with this, right? But it's this lesson that we are all in this together. We see it in India right now with the variants there, right? And now we are sort of like, well, but we almost vaccinated here, so the pandemic is almost over. However, it isn't over until it's over for everybody. Right, and we are very, very, very far from that goal. And again, I think a lot of your work has shown shown exactly the importance of that. So the last question comes from Tanvi here, um, and from the this is uh, going back to the Ebola story, which is that the reintroductions of previous outbreak strain, as we saw in 2021, how can you determine the lower rate of mutations was because of latency of virus, and if the virus is circulating in non-human hosts? Is the rate of mutation different from what you would expect um, in latency? Yeah, so I think that the first part about like how we know that there was persistent infection, um, that, that's actually a good question. So you see these, these two particular samples here were actually taken from the same individual uh, some time apart. Um, and you see sort of, there was this one big uh, uh, outbreak that one, not big, but you know, one outbreak caused by by the uh, relapse of uh, Ebola in this one patient, and you see that this evolutionary branch essentially uh, connects uh, this uh, sample with this outbreak, and so that's how we know that you know this is the branch that probably had uh, persistent infection. Um, and in fact, based on this, is how we first realized that it probably might be persistent infection. Um, in terms of non-human hosts, that's 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 a very good question. Um, I mean, unless you actually go out and surveil and sequence um, the viral genomes from reservoir species, uh, it, it, it might not be straightforward to infer 
um, exactly um, how the uh, virus is actually moving around uh, reservoir in, in non-human non -human species. Um, but um, in the evolutionary tree itself, um, if you, you can see, you, you will be able to see if, the, if it's a completely new jump from a reservoir species, um, because imagine you have like a big, you know, global phylogeny of Ebola, um, and you have a certain outbreak, but if, it's, if there's a jump from a reservoir species, then there'll be a certain amount of evolution that you would not have captured because you're not sampling the reservoir species. Um, and so that cluster, that cleared sort of cluster distinct from, you know, let's say a previous outbreak, or, or, or there will be an, an enough amount of divergence from one outbreak and, and that new uh, cluster that uh, happened because of a jump from a reservoir species. So you, you could um, determine if a virus, if the virus is actually jumping from a reservoir into into a uh, human population, but but it's not it, it, it's it's not an easy answer. It's not straightforward, and, and that sort of requires careful analysis. So when but, we look at, I mean, if, if we, for example, if we look at the twenty twenty one reemergence in Guinea, right, which connects five five years ago to survivors there, which is a long time to walk around with the, with Ebola in your body. You're not sick. You don't actually have Ebola disease, right? But the virus is there. Are we a hundred percent sure? that you know that virus actually did evolve in a single individual during that period of time and i can take that back to when we're looking at sars cov2 and looking at something like b117 which is the opposite right here you actually see increased rates of evolution during chronic infections not decreased uh, uh, rate of evolution here are we 100 percent sure that all of these always happens in humans or could there actually be alternative explanations here that we're not currently considering Um, I think I, I, uh, I, I don't think there's an easy answer to that question. So the, the, for example, like the Guinea outbreak connected by a long branch, um, that, um, so, so that evolution could have very well happened in humans or in a reservoir species. Um, the only way you will actually detect it is if you, if, if the uh, evolutionary rate of that branch had a jump, either it was too low or it was too high. So any variation in sort of evolutionary rate along that branch would sort of point to um, how that, uh, you know, the virus sort of continued persisting. Um, with respect to SARS-CoV-2, the, the suspicion is that it's within humans because uh, the amount of time it was, I think the, um, uh, the, the virus was essentially uh, the TMRCA of the B117 was in early September. And, and so within basically a month, um, it clocked in about 14 amino acid, non-synonymous amino acid mutations. Um, now, uh, in, in, in general, uh, you know, the, the SARS-CoV-2 um, accumulates one mutation every two weeks. And so that's an exceptionally high amount of mutations for such a short interval of time. And, and, and so in that case, it, 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 it probably makes sense that evolutionary process was different. And, and given the rate of transmission um, at the time, uh, the most plausible explanation would be that it happened in, a, in, in some sort of a chronic infection in an individual. Um, with, the, with Ebola though, that question is more tricky. And I'm not sure, I, I don't have a good answer to that. Yeah, I think you just said it though, because you said it's the most plausible explanation, right? That's why I asked you if you're 100% sure, because we aren't. Right. That's 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 the key thing here that that a lot of what we're doing here is not to get a proof. Right. But it's highly consistent with processes that we do have some data on and have reason to believe that there could be mechanistic reasons for why it's this this way and not that way, for example. But yeah, complete proof proofs at 100 uh, percent certainly lacking. Um, all right. So those were for the questions. Uh, thank you again, Kartik. This was fantastic. Um, we have a private session next up. Uh, Paul, is there a couple of things before we hop over to that? No, that was all. Just, uh, just remember to copy that link in the chat box, and we'll see you there in a few minutes. Thank you, Paul. And thank you all again for attending this talk. Great talk, Kartik. Thank you.